Before we begin, don't forget that there are currently three applications out for the Queen's Gambit Decline available for iPhone and for Android. Welcome back to ChessOpenings.com. In today's video, we'll take a look at the middle game and end game phase of a game which I played in 2015 February against a fellow national master, Victor's Pupils. In the previous video, we described the opening phase, which began with the moves pawn to d4, knight to f6, pawn to c4, pawn to d6, bringing in a position which is generally known as the old Indian, knight to f3, preventing pawn to e5, bishop to f5, an irregular move, pawn to g3, pawn to c6, knight to c3, pawn to e6, bishop to g2, Knight to e4, moving the knight a second time. Castles kingside, knight to d7, knight to d2, very interesting. Knight takes c3, b takes c3, pawn to d5, pawn takes pawn on d5, pawn takes pawn on d5, pawn to c4, pawn takes pawn on c4 was played, pawn to e4, bishop to g6 as the move, bishop to e6 could be met with pawn to d5, which instantly wins material after pawn takes pawn on d5, pawn takes pawn on d5, bishop f5, rookie one check, followed by pawn to d6. And therefore, black replied to the move, pawn to e4 with bishop to g6, knight takes c4 was played, and now after knight to b6, knight to e5, bishop to e7, pawn to f4, threatening the move, pawn to f5, pawn to f6, knight takes g6, h takes g6, Bishop to e3 over protecting the d4 pawn and getting the bishop out. Black castled kingside. Queen to b3 check was played. King to h7. And then we ended the video with the move pawn to g4, clarifying that white has a space advantage in the center. The bishop pair, chances of attack against the king, chances of attack on the queen side, and a slight development advantage as the rooks are already connected. Now, from here, Probably the most logical move would be pawn to f5, in which case black is ready to respond to the key threat rook to f3 with the move f takes g4, depriving the rook of the h3 square. And there are different ways that white can handle this move. Perhaps simply going for pawn to a4 would be one option here, preparing the attack here, and then maybe pawn to d5 or pawn to e5 or possibly exchanging pawns on f5. In any case, white continues to have many of the advantages which we spoke about just a moment ago. And probably it would be pawn to a4, pawn to a5, because white is threatening pawn to a5, rook a to b1, perhaps bishop to b4, and perhaps the rook can swing to d1, and this position continues to be very strong for white. In any case, rather than playing the move pawn to f5, Victor's pupils played the move queen to e8, preparing to bring the queen to the f7 square. White began to open up a second front with the move pawn to a4. And in this case, black cannot even reply with the move pawn to a5, as now that the queen is no longer on the d8 square, the knight on b6 is hanging. Therefore, after pawn to a4, black replied with queen to f7. An exchange of queens took place on the f7 square. And now, just before playing the move pawn to a5, white shows a little bit of technique by first depriving the knight of the c4 square with the move rook f to c1. And by now, white's advantage is decisive. The threat here is to bring the pawn up to a5 and then up to the a6 square, immediately creating all kinds of damage along the pawn front here. And at the same time, white still has the bishop pair, still has extra central space, and there's still some disharmony between the placement of the pieces on the king side as the rook on f7 is not ideally placed. Anticipating these problems, black played the move knight to c8, so that after the move a5, which was played, he could now reply with pawn to a6, and all of this took place in the game. Now, white is looking for an opportunity 
to cash in on some of these advantages he's gained in the position so far. And to do so, I quickly played the move pawn to d5 with the intention of bringing this light squared bishop into the game. Now, how does the move pawn to d5 include the light squared bishop into the game? Presently, the pawn on d5 attacks the pawn on c6, and it's practically mandatory for black to recapture with pawn takes pawn on d5, as he did in the game. But now, after pawn takes pawn on d5, I continued not with pawn takes pawn on d5, which would continue to block in this bishop on g2 and allow black to achieve a blockading square with knight to d6, but I instead played the move pawn to e5, very strong, denying the knight the d6 square and simply leaving the pawn on d5 as a sitting duck for the light squared bishop to get involved in the game with bishop takes d5. And for example, if black were to try the move pawn takes pawn on d5 on e5 rather than continuing bishop takes d5 e takes f4 which could get a little bit complicated giving black some compensation white can simply reply with pawn takes pawn on e5 and presently black is threatened with disaster as after bishop takes d5 even after rook f8 bishop takes on b7 Black will be losing two pawns on the queen's side, and this will simply be too much with the bishop pair and a passed a pawn. In order to avoid this fate, there's only a small number of things which black might try. For example, if black were to try to create some extra defense along the b along the seventh rank for the b pawn with bishop to b4, he would be in for a very rude awakening after the move rook to a4, attacking the bishop here and forcing the bishop to retreat to either e7 or f8, both of which will be disasters for black. In the event of bishop to f8, there could follow bishop takes d5, rook to e7, and now the move g5 is going to lead to mate with rook to h4. And of course, if black were to retreat the bishop to the e7 square, then bishop takes d5 followed by bishop takes b7 would be enough to cause serious damage. So the move bishop to b4 will not solve black's problems. Alternatively, black may try the move pawn to d4, and now after bishop takes d4, eventually something's gonna fall on the queen side here. And so this is a very difficult position for black to play and again, it's almost certainly losing. So white can simply recapture the pawn with pawn takes pawn on e5 if black is to capture this pawn on e5. Instead of taking the pawn on e5, my opponent went for the move bishop to d8, attacking the pawn on a5 in this position and perhaps looking to create some kind of counterplay. And in fact, I did fall into a little bit of a trap here, playing the move pawn to e6, rook to c7, rook takes c7, bishop takes c7, and actually eventually trading off this pawn on the a5 square. However, there was a stronger approach available. Instead of playing the move pawn to e6, if white captures on the d5 square, now there are only two ways to respond which look interesting for black here. He can either play rook to d7 or rook to c7. In the case of rook to c7, white will quickly win material with rook takes c7, bishop takes c7, and then rook to c1, followed by bishop takes b7, picking up a piece. And this rules out this move. In the event of rook d7, it's a little bit harder to see the tactical solution to this move. But what white can play is the move rook to d1, setting up a very difficult to prevent threat of rook bishop to g8 check, picking up the rook in exchange for the bishop. And if black plays, let's say, king to h8, removing this threat, White can still win material with bishop takes b7, followed by rook takes d8 check, bringing the other rook to the c file, and white will continue to have a very strong passed e pawn 
and a winning position. So this would have been the knockout blow which was possible after bishop to d8. But instead I played the inferior move, pawn to e6, allowing black a chance to play rook to c7. I now continued bishop takes d5, rook takes c1 was played, rook takes c1 was played. And now from here, black played the move knight to e7, after which white continued with the move bishop takes b7, attacking the rook on a8 and the pawn on a6. And now black played the only reasonable reply, rook to b8, bishop takes a6 was played, and now bishop takes a5. And from here, it's at this point that I made an important mistake which the opponent could have taken advantage of in this position. I continued with the move king to g2 designed to simply improve the position of the king, but instead the move king to f2 would have been much better for reasons we'll see in just a moment. In fact, my opponent played knight to d5 and this move had been completely unexpected. During the time control, I simply missed this opportunity for black to play knight to d5, attacking the bishop and simultaneously threatening to capture on f4, followed by capturing on e6. And in the event of king to f3, black now has to watch out for the move rook to b3, and that's a problem in this position. So the move knight d5 came as a nasty surprise in this position. And after some thought, again, this was a game in 60 time control, so both players were moving very quickly here. After some thought, I continued with the move bishop to a7. And now black returned the favor with a huge mistake, rook to b2 check, allowing me to continue with king to f3 and still a dominating position. The idea of bishop to a7 was to create this idea of rook to a8 followed by bishop to b7. But I didn't like this idea because after rook takes a7, bishop takes d5, even though white remains a pawn ahead and has some chances of winning, it's going to be difficult because of the opposite colored bishops. This is how I thought the game would continue, but in fact, there's an even better move available for black after bishop to b7. He can simply play knight takes f4 check, king to f3, and now rather than playing the move rook takes a7, it's actually possible for black to play the, because rook takes a7 can be met with e7, and this was the idea of the combination. This is exactly what I was hoping to play in the game. Instead, black can throw in this very amazing move, rook to e8, and now in the event of king takes f4, there is bishop to d2 check, or it may also be possible to play the move rook to e7. So this intermediate move of rook to e8 after knight takes f4 check is very likely what my opponent missed after the move bishop to a7. And so instead he played the rook clear up to the b2 square, but now white is able to defend the f4 pawn and the e2 square, and he continues to hold on to the extra pawn on e6 and the bishop pair. And from here there's no going back. The position is definitely drifting towards a loss for black. And from here, the game rapidly concluded with pawn to f5, pawn takes pawn on f5, rook to b3 check, black is just playing some desperate tricks here, king to e4, knight to f6 check, king to e5, now the king is supporting the pawn's movement up the board, bishop to c3 check, bishop to d4, knight to g4 check, king to d5 was played, knight to f6 check, king to c4 was played, rook to a3, rook takes c3, rook takes a6, bishop takes f6, g takes f6, and black resigned after the move pawn to e7, as the only move here is going to be rook to a8, 
King d5 will be played, and there's no way of preventing white from playing king to e6 and supporting the king's eventual promotion and the win of the rook. The play of this game was simply a demonstration of the various advantages which white had at the outset of the middle game. White had the bishop pair, the better space, and also differing opportunities to create weaknesses in the opponent's position. However, it's worth noting that there was a single moment in the game where if black would have been sufficiently tactically alert, he could have managed to successfully bring the game into equality. As is so often the case in victories and losses at any level of the game, very often even the most hopeless games offer some opportunities to save the position, and this should always give us heart whenever we have a weaker position, we should always be looking for unexpected resources that may be at our disposal. That's all for today, and we'll see you again soon. Before you go, be sure to check out the two applications we have available for the King's Indian Defense, available for iPhone and for Android.